got quite a few people haven't taken exam one yet, so I will be handing those back until everyone has finished it. If you have not made arrangements with me to take them, please make sure that you do. Still, 
Uh, Interfed research is a pretty big area of study at the moment. But what they're finding is that even though they look random, if you film them and you digitize that film and you slow it right down and you look at joint angles and patterns of movement and the relationship between uh, different parts of the limb around the joint, then what we see is that they actually show some similarity to some adult skills. All right. So for example, these when they're shaking their arms like this, they actually look quite similar to a reaching movement that you would do as an adult. The kicking that we see has some timing issues that are very similar to walking. It's not the same as walking, but they have similar temporal, what we call temporal issues. And if you have a look on page 104, they've got a nice figure there trying to show you um, the similarity between the skill. What we see is different is when the child is kicking, the whole leg moves as one, whereas when we walk, we move our femur, and then we move our knee, and then we move our ankle, right? But the, the overall pattern is somewhat similar. So, here we have kicking, and all of these clips will also be available when you look at your web page, alright? So you can go back and look at them again easily without having to go into the PowerPoint so that you can watch and see. See how those legs just kind of, she's, she's not paying any attention, she's not trying to kick her legs, she's trying to, she's looking at mum, she's looking at the ball, and yet those legs are banging away and they're like crazy, right? So what interested people about this is the more we learn about the brain, the more we look at cognitive understanding, cognitive development, the more we look at perceptual development, the more we see a connection with motor development. And as we learn more about the brain, it becomes quite clear that the brain doesn't do anything for no reason. Right? This isn't driven by any cognition in the baby, but the central nervous system and the brain are driving this movement. Now why? Right? Baby's not moving, it's not going anywhere, it doesn't need anything, it's being looked after, it's being fed, it's warm. Why is the brain creating a movement that isn't achieving something? So this was the kind of question that people had when they started getting good enough equipment. A lot of research links to the improvement in the kinds of equipment we have. Right? So better cameras, being able to put digitizers on, being able to put the film into a software package and slow it down frame by frame. All of these things help people that research this kind of idea come up with new, new thoughts about what's going on. So what they decided, what they're thinking right now is because they look so similar to some of these older skills mechanically, maybe this is the brain starting to work out how do I contract that muscle? Okay. We don't have to think about that as adults. You've got plenty of practice of moving. When you walk, 
you contract first your flexors and then your extensors in sequence. And the brain has to time that so that your walking pattern is smooth. You don't have to think about it, the brain just does it for you. When you watch her kicking, the brain is contracting the flexor and the extensor at the same time. So it's like it has to learn the sequence of contractions. Right? So maybe that's what stereotypies do, these spontaneous behaviors. Perhaps it's the brain's first attempt at trying to work out how do I send off signals to one part of the muscle and then another part of the muscle. Reflexes are seen very, very quickly once you supply the stimulus. Right, so different kettle of fish. And they involve specific muscles. It's a specific response to a specific signal. We often use them for diagnosis. So you have a baby, you take it in for its checkup at the clinic, and they'll do some reflex tests because it gives them a picture of what's going on in the brain, right? Typically, we see reflexes. We'll talk about atypical in a second, right? So we don't extinguish them. Every time you give the stimulus, you will see the reflex, all right? So they don't habituate. It's not like if you live by the train line, at some point you almost don't hear the train. Right? You habituate to the sound of the train and it's part of the environment and you don't even notice it. And then your parents come visit and they're like, how can you sleep in this? That train went by at one o'clock, at three o'clock. Right? And you're like, oh, don't even notice it anymore. We habituate. Reflexes don't habituate. All right? so, we don't extinguish them, they are always there, should always be there. Now, if they're not there, or they're doing something odd, then we can infer some kind of disorder or some problems going on. So if the reflex persists after you take the stimulus away, if the reflex isn't there when you give the stimulus, if the response is unequal, so I do one side of the body and then I test the other side and the, the reflex is not the same strength on both sides. Those are the kinds of things that the clinicians are looking for because it indicates that there's something not quite in line neurologically. Because typically we're going to see the all the time. So what are the purposes for these reflexes? Why do we do them? Some of them are so obviously there to help the baby survive the first few months. Some of them are more to do with the baby almost trying to get itself upright or have some kind of interaction with the environment. So they split them into three groups. When you look in, in this chapter, they've got a very nice table that splits the reflexes up into three groups. We have primitive reflexes. So these are the ones that seem pretty clearly to help the baby survive. If you go back, a long, 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 long time, and baby is born in a cave with no electricity, no heat, no light, <laughs> right? then that child needed some strategies in place to survive. Okay? We also have postural reactions, postural reflexes, so the brain's trying to organize what's going on here. Can I sit upright? And locomotor reflexes. 
So how do I move one leg? How do I move one arm? So they're pretty cool to look at because there's something going on. The brain is learning something all the time. Okay. And we're pretty certain that these reflexes are the start of some pretty good building blocks. We've talked about our fundamental skills, running, jumping, catching, throwing, as building blocks for later sport skills. Okay. Well, what's the building block for the fundamental skill? So, our first stage are our reflexes. So they've got film of lots of different reflexes at the website, but we've got just a couple to show you here. Asymmetrical tonic neck reflex. Um, you also will see this if the baby is prone, if they're on their tummy, um, which always makes a lot of sense to me. But whether they're on their tummy or their back, you turn the head to one side, and what you see when you turn their head to one side is the arm and the leg on that side stretch out a bit. Well, if you imagine putting a baby down on a floor that isn't level, and I put the baby down and it starts to roll, it can smother itself. Right? You walk away, you've got to go cook dinner, or, and you come back and the baby's lying on the tray so this reflex seems to be a safety mechanism. If I turn the baby's chin and the arm and the leg stretch out, it can't roll now. Right? So it can't smother itself now. that that arm and leg on the side of the body that the head is turned to are stretching out. Grasping reflex. Everybody knows this one. This is the one where you visit with a baby and you give them your finger and they grab hold of your finger and they squeeze and then you can't get your finger away and it's you know everyone's like oh look that's so cute they love you they don't love you it's a reflex they can't stop themselves all right it's not voluntary so what happens with this one the stimulus is anything that touches the palm of the hand causes the fingers to curl over we also have what, the same one on our foot, planter rather than palmer. If you press something against the sole of the foot, the toes will curl over. All right. So the hand closes tightly around the finger or an object. Girls with long hair know this one, or necklaces. You lean over the baby and they grab hold of your necklace, or they grab hold of your hair, right? The problem with this reflex is the brain goes this way, hasn't yet learned to open the hand, so you have to prise the fingers off in order to get back whatever it is the baby's grabbing hold of. Right? The brain's only working out one direction at this point. And then the first one was asymmetrical. This is symmetrical tonic neck reflex. And here, you're going to be holding the child sitting upright. And if you tilt their head forwards, then they're, let me get it around the right way. Tilt their head forwards, arms stretch out, legs flex. If you tilt their head backwards, their legs stretch out and their arms bend. 
And I haven't done enough work with infants, and I've not had kids. So I'm still working. My brain, I'm like, how does that help them out? I can't. But it's considered one of these primitive safety mechanisms. Um, Moreau. Moreau is the first version of what we think of as a startle reflex, but they developed a startle reflex a few months later. And as adults, a startle reflex is one of the ones we still have. So if someone suddenly calls your name or slams the door behind you, right? You jump. Okay. Well, the first version is a Moreau, and in the Moreau, you give the stimulus, you can tap the pillow, shake the pillow, and what you see is initially everything stretches out and then it tucks in. When the startle reflex kicks in and the Moreau reflex kind of gets overdone, then we don't get the extension. If you watch an adult do a startle reflex, what they do is, right, and tuck in. So the baby gets there a couple of months later. So that's one they use quite a lot in clinics. Um, another one that they use is a Babinski. And so on a Babinski, they'll take socks and shoes off stroke the base of the foot from the heel towards the toe and all the toes fan <coughs> so they use that one a lot so when you go see your doctor Berminski will be one that they'll do as well um, let's see uh, a stepping reflex is one of the locomotor reflexes place the soles of the feet on a flat surface so you could be supporting the baby on the floor, you could have them standing on the change table. Okay. What you'll see is they pick their knees up. Okay. So it's called the stepping reflex. And it's an interesting one when we look at our constraints idea because the research has given us some useful information. In the old days, we always thought reflexes went away. You see them, and then you don't see them. And this child starts voluntary movement, and the assumption was that the reflexes disappeared. Well, in children, the stepping reflex disappears around six or seven months, I think around six or seven months. Okay. Disappears. Well, about that time, they've put on quite a lot of chubby. They become very chubby. When they're born, they're not very chubby. By six months, they're very chubby. And their legs are nice and round and squishy. They've got those little folds in the knees, and they get and their feet are all puffy, and they're, they're very cute, right? But what they found was the stepping reflex has gone away. When I pick this baby up, I don't see the stepping reflex anymore. But when I put the baby in a big tub of water, I do see the stepping <coughs> reflex. So, equine people use water baths to rehab their horses. Hospitals use pools for the elderly and for physio. Why? What happens when I'm in the water? Why do we use water for a rehab situation? Your body feels lighter, right? The water supports your weight. Okay? So, what happens then is not that the reflex disappears, it's that the weight of the legs gets to a point where the muscles aren't strong enough. Even though it's involuntary, the muscles still have to move the legs. The legs get so heavy 
that the muscles can't create the reflex anymore, but when you put the baby in the water and the weight is supported, the reflex didn't disappear. It's still there. Right? It's a constraint that changes the behavior we see. So it's a perfect example of our constraints triangle. It's a great piece of research. All right? I see stepping reflex. Okay. And at six, seven months, now I don't see stepping reflex. If I change the behavior, I had to change a constraint, I put more weight on the legs.
brain imaging is changing everything we know about how the brain works. And they do do brain imaging on babies. They you, there's, you can find pictures where they're sitting there with electrodes, an electrode cap on, <coughs> and they can watch what the brain is doing when they elicit a particular reflex. So later infancy, we start to see some voluntary movement. Yay, that's what we we want to work with, right? We don't. We're not infant people. You will probably, most of you, be infant people at some point in your life. But you might not be thinking about that right now. Right? What happens when we look at voluntary movement? So, voluntary control changes everything for this child. Right? As soon as I've got some voluntary control, when I can move my arm on purpose, now I can start to deliberately interact and explore my environment and things I'm being given. Okay. So there's a big difference here between giving a baby a toy, a rattle, a ring, or something, when they have a palm grasp their brain's going to learn something about that toy, but the individual isn't doing anything with that toy. Okay. Once I can try to get that toy for myself, now I've got some control. And I want to explore everything. So the first thing we do, everything goes in the mouth. because our laws of direction play a role. I develop head to toe, so the nerves and the sensory organs in my mouth are more mature than the ones in my fingers. So top down, middle out. So I don't touch things to find out what they feel like, I have to stick them in my mouth to find out what they feel like. So babies stick everything in their mouth, right? Everything. <laughs> so they don't, don't leave anything down, right? It gives me the opportunity to have a meaningful interaction because if you look at me and you wave your hand and I can follow you around and kind of wiggle my arms on purpose, then I'm starting a dialogue with the person that's trying to interact with me. And I can start to develop some postural strength. So the postural reflexes are really important because once I start voluntary control, if I haven't learned some control of these postural muscles, I can't do anything. So the postural reflexes begin around four months, involuntary. They help to maintain your posture as you move the baby around. So labyrinth in writing reflex. If I tip the baby over, its head stays upright for as long as possible. Humans like to be upright. So when I'm seeing them move around four months, mostly what I'm seeing is still involuntary. So here's my labyrinth in writing reflex. Humans don't like being on the skew. They kind of like being upright. So if you tip me over, my brain tries to keep me upright for as long as it can. Some other ones we see, parachute. So if I go towards the ground, I stretch my arms out. You still do that as an adult. Rotative writing, if I turn the head and then I roll the shoulders and the hips over. We like to be straight, not twisted.
and these reflexes all build towards some motor milestones. We've got our fundamental motor skills we've already talked about. We've still got to have walking. We haven't stood up yet. So this, is, this foundation is a little bit lower down than the skills we've already started looking at. But they're all specific movements that lead into some general actions. How do I sit upright? Well, I don't sit upright with my head stuck over on the side, right? We sit upright with our head upright. So being able to control what's going on here and keep my head in one place is important. voluntary movement and our laws of direction dictate voluntary movement is going to start at the top. Okay? That's just the way it goes. So what do we see first? Well hopefully around eight weeks they're going to be able to lift or start to lift their head up lying on their tummy. Okay? So it's not really postural, and we haven't really started those postural reflexes yet because right now all I'm doing is blobbing on the blanket. Okay. It's easy to remember which way they lift their head first because feel the back of your neck. How big are the muscles in the back of your neck? Okay. You've got those two. Great big, I think George has, yeah, which doesn't have those muscles there. Right. Two great big lumps of muscle running up each side of the spine. What about on the front? How big are the muscles on the front of your neck? Kind of skinny, right? So, remember our picture of how big the head is in relation to the body the other week, right? Head is massive, body is teeny, teeny, tiny. So, given this great big heavy head, am I going to use the skinny muscles to lift my head up or the big heavy fat strong muscles to lift my head up? Big heavy fat strong muscles, right? So, then the first thing I get to do is lift my head up from lying on my tummy. I can't lift my head up lying on my back. I've only got these little skinny muscles. So, about eight weeks, give or take, if you give the baby enough tummy time, and here's another crucial point, because there was a point in time where people got very, very nervous about putting babies on their tummy because it was linked with sudden death, some, some infant death syndrome. And so people got very nervous and they spent all their time putting the baby down on the back, on the back, on the back. Well, that's great, but baby can't move on its back. It can only move on its front. And the ceiling is really, really, really boring when you've been lying there for a very long time looking at it because you can't move. Right? So, you have to give them tummy time because on their tummies, at around eight weeks, they're going to start trying to lift their head up because they're nosy, they're inquisitive. They want to see what the heck is going on. Well, I can't see it if my face is in the blanket. I have to lift my head up and look around at my environment. By about 12 weeks, they can start to lift their shoulders a little bit as well. So their strength and their neural development is working down. So 
a little bit of stereotypy stuff still going on with the legs because that's not voluntary. But he's able to keep his head up, look around. Oh. Oh. That's about it. Not going to get much more than that. But that's a big step because once I can start looking around, I can start learning stuff. Friday we'll start looking at chapter 7. 